Way back in 2008, the UN Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, made the following statement, and I think it's quite relevant for us today. He said, there is one universal truth applicable to all countries and communities. Violence against women is never acceptable, never excusable, and never tolerable. And yet, a recent report by the World Health Organization tells us that globally, one in three women will or has experienced physical and or sexual violence. Now, I'm not a very good mathematician, I'm a geographer, but my calculations, in my calculations, that's about one billion women and girls in this world have suffered sexual or physical abuse. That is staggering, I think. I hope you will agree. The situation is much worse if you're a woman or a girl who is living in a, a conflict-affected region or you live in a community where female genital mutilation is the social norm. And this session, this conversation this afternoon is going to focus on those two issues. We have two inspirational women here who have experience and expertise in sexually based violence in conflict areas, the president of Kosovo here, and um, Dr. Adnan Ismail, who wants to be called Edna, who has a great deal of, ex uh, of experience of FGM in Somaliland and beyond. So just to give you some context, and I'm not going to take up too much more time, I just want to give you some figures. I'm going to start by looking at um, sexually based, um, or gender based violence in conflict affected areas. And just some shocking figures. In DRC, for example, 40% of women are survivors of conflict-related sexual violence. In Rwanda, the vast majority of Tutsi women in the 1994 genocide were exposed to some form of sexual violence, and an estimated half a million women have survived rape in that country alone. But this is not just something that happens somewhere else. It also happens in Europe. We'll hear more about this, I'm sure, in the next few, you know, few minutes. But for example, in the early 1990s, in the Bosnia-Herzegovina conflict, 20 to 50,000 women were raped. Rape has become a weapon of war. This abuse of women in conflict areas is not just associated with the conflict itself. Women suffer sexual and gender-based violence whilst fleeing from conflict, whilst in displacement settings such as refugee camps, and when repatriated, and we've heard a little bit about that in the previous session. This violence stays with these women all of their life. Just a few things to say about FGM to put it into context. A recent UNICEF report earlier this year estimates that globally 200 million women and girls are survivors of FGM, with 3 million girls and women at risk each year. Some figures that bring this back down to reality, if you like, those figures are so great we can hardly you know, comprehend them. Indonesia is the country with the highest number of survivors of FGM. Over 50 million women have survived FGM and are living in Indonesia. In many countries in Africa and the Middle East, over 80% of women have been subjected to FGM, including Egypt, Sudan, Eritrea and Djibouti. But this again is not a problem that happens somewhere else. It's a global issue. It's happening here. The EU Parliament estimated that a half a million women survivors of FGM are living in the member states. And in the UK, it is estimated that 170,000 women are affected by FGM and 65,000 girls under the age of 13 are at risk. Now, this is an abuse quite different from the, the abuse that happens in conflict areas because it's perpetrated on girls by loving parents. 
who believe that they are doing what is right and best for their daughters. We are going to hear much more about this, I'm sure, in the next 30 minutes. So, for too long, these abuses have been, quote, history's great silences. They've been shrouded in darkness. But not for much longer, we hope. Over the last 30 years, the world has begun to see into this darkness, due in part to the inspirational work of the two ladies sitting next to me. These two ladies are a shining light in that darkness. So be prepared for an emotional session, an inspirational session, which we hope will give us all hope that sometime soon that historical silent abuses that are being perpetrated on women will be put into history and we won't have to have this discussion again. So thank you very much. I hope that put everything into context for you. What we're going to do is I'm going to ask the um, president here to say, um, give us a, a, a sort of a statement, a, an introduction to her and her work. And then I'm going to ask um, Dr. Edna to say some words and then we will have a conversation and, and then we'll draw it to a close. Thank you very much, President. Yeah. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Hazel, thank you so much. And it is a distinguished pleasure for me to be uh, with you this afternoon. And uh, it is also my distinguished pleasure to be sharing this podium together with Dr. Edna, an incredible woman that has done so much uh, to end the suffering of thousands of women in many or in all of the African countries. And I really appreciate for everything what you have done, Edna, for the women of the African uh, countries. And I salute you for that. Uh, today I will be speaking about uh, one of the most painful past of the recent history of Kosovo, about the survivors of the sexual violence during the war in Kosovo, which has taken place about 17 years ago. A silenced weapon of the war, which has left deep wounds and consequences for my people and for my country, which has destroyed the lives of thousands and hundreds and thousands of citizens around the world. Hazel, this issue has become so personal to me immediately after I have taken over my office as the President of the Republic of Kosovo back in 2011. Not only because this has touched uh, my society, my country, the very fabric of our own country, but also because it has uh, planted the seeds of pain, of fear, of suffering, of thousands of the victims, men and women, if on our country, but also became a personal issue to me because still 17 years after the end of the war, this issue continues to be, unfortunately, an open wound for our country, for the men and women of my own society. It became also very personal to me that not only that I've seen that happening in our country 17 years ago, you have very well said, 20 years ago, 40,000 women have been direct victims of the sexual violence from the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In Sudan, in Nigeria, in Rwanda, it's happening even today's day in Syria and other corners of the world. And the question to me it is, how much longer we are going to leave this situation going on? Just a few days ago, before coming here, I read a very inspiring article by a good friend of mine, uh, Christine Amanpour. And she has uh, very uh, highly said that I would rather be truthful than be neutral. I think that the current global trend is more having the approach of neutral. And actually, we cannot handle this approach of being neutral. We have to be, first of all, true to ourselves, true to the roles and responsibility that each and every one has, no matter are we heads of states, heads of the governments, or heads of the international organizations. 
For many of you which are not familiar with uh, Kosovo's history, Kosovo 17 years ago came out of the terrible war, which has left deep wounds and consequences that even today's day we are paying a big price to that, leaving behind over tens of thousands of people who have been killed and massacred. Still 17 years after the end of the war, we are having over 1,600 people missing in different massive graves within the territory of Kosovo and the territory of Serbia, and over 20,000 women which have been direct victims of the sexual violence used as a tool of war. Sexual violence was used as a tool of war towards thousands of women and men in our country for the purpose of inciting fear, oppression, ethnic cleansing, to emasculate the man and to strip off the whole society from its human values. Thousands of men and women which has been direct victims of the sexual violence for 17 years in the role, they carry these scars and the wounds of the heinous crime that has been conducted unjustly by the police, paramilitary and military forces of Serbia, which they turn their bodies into the battlefields for the political gains. Immediately after the end of the war, as a country, we started rebuilding ourselves, rebuilding our country from the ashes of the war, having a lot of struggles with many challenges to building our society, being a peace, building a peaceful country, stable and a secure country. But somehow, unconsciously, we have forgotten about the survivors of the sexual violence. We have kept them unconsciously in the silence for the continuous over 10 years after the end of the war to battle with their shame, with isolation and social exclusion without any institutional or the social response. How fair and how we were able to one more time or hundred more times to re-victimize them even after the war has ended in the country. And knowing all of this situation, immediately after the end of the war, uh, immediately after election, my election as the president of Kosovo back in 2011, in my first few days in the office, I decided to meet with a group of the survivors of the sexual violence. I, I started with a number of 36 of them that day. It was in my fir first or second week in the office. And today date counts over thousands of them that I personally talked to them and listened to every single story of them, what they have gone through. And talking to them, listening to them, I came to the conclusion that the war has unfortunately not ended yet for them. While we, as the citizens of our country, we were enjoying our freedoms and liberties, we didn't pay attention to thousands of women and men which were still living with the horrors that they have gone through over 17 years after the end of the war. And my dear ladies and gentlemen, I heard stories of the women that their dream never became true of becoming a mother because of the loss of the unborn child due to the horrific crimes of the rape that they have gone through. I heard the stories of the mothers which they have witnessed the gang raping of their daughters I heard the stories of the young children who have not survived out of these inhuman acts. I heard the stories of the women which have been raped in front of their husbands, fathers, brothers, in front of the entire village. I also heard the stories of the women which they lost everything, including their families, due to the stigma and the taboo that we unjustly 
unveiled on them this veil of the shame through for several years after the end of the war. I met a mother that she was raped the same day together with three of her daughters. She was in her early 40s. Her oldest daughter was 17. The other daughter was 15. And the youngest one was 13 with a Down syndrome. Exactly the same day, her mother was by chance visiting her that day when the paramilitary forces entered her house and committed this crime. She couldn't cope what she had seen happening to her daughter and to her granddaughters. She went outside, jumped into the whale, and committed a suicide. I met a mother that she was six months pregnant when she was gang raped. She miscarried immediately after the action. But the worst part is that two years old son was killed the same day including her husband. I met a mother that she was kept for a continuous six months imprisonment in her own house with three of her children, systematically raped for the continuous six months in pregnancy well, and without knowing what to do, she drink chemicals, hoping that she will die too. And when the paramilitary forces got an order to leave out of that village, on the way out, they raped her daughter of five years old. In all of these stories, I also witnessed a courage of so many of young girls, of women, and women of my own country. Finding the strength and courage of moving on, rebuilding their life for the sake of their families, for the sake of their own children, for the sake of their own society. To fight the stigma every single day that was surrounding, without paying attention to what they have been going through for the continuous years after the end of the war and finding the courage to even encourage themselves to come up, to step up, to speak about this heinous crime that has been conducted unjustly into their bodies and calling each other heroines of our society because indeed they are the biggest heroines of our society. It was exactly their strength and their courage, which gave me the hope that their pledge for the national and international recognition, the pledge for the justice, and the pledge to the finally come to the term of peace will be heard one day. Because I will tell you today that even 17 years after the end of the war has passed, we don't have not even a single individual or the perpetrator that has been facing the justice or they have been facing with the consequences about what they have been doing to the thousands of the victims of the sexual violence. And this might be even surprising you mostly because of the political situation of our country that we are facing Kosovo is not a member state of the United Nations, and so that's why the sacrifice of over 20,000 victims of the sexual violence is still not being recognized as the crime committed towards them. So how fair is this? Even if it was one victim, it would be so much of the injustice done, not only that we are speaking about over 20,000 women. So seeing this situation, what was dominated in our country, seeing my competences as the head of state, which the constitution is slightly different in my country, I said to myself that situation has to change. Situation is not going to be the way that used to be for the continuous 13 years after the end of the war. 
I start talking with all of the institutions. I start talking with the civil society. I start talking with uh, many of the NGOs, especially with the women NGOs in the country, which I am forever grateful to them because they were the only door which the women of my country could knock freely and could seek the help and support, starting from the medical uh, assistance and all the way down to the psychological treatment. And I came to the decision to establish the National Council for the Survivors of the Sexual Violence, which I led personally. And I made sure that around that decision-making table, I bring the whole government, including prime minister, ministers, president of the parliament, civil society, NGOs, medias, and others. And I am proud to say today that what we were able to achieve within one year, starting from regulating their legal status, gaining the rights that every other victim of the war was enjoying immediately after the war, but they have been not enjoying these rights, which the law is supposed to guarantee these rights, and all the way down to their re rehabilitation, reintegration, and resocialization, including in the economic empowerment of the, all survivors of the sexual violence. In purpose, I mentioned the economic empowerment because it's such a powerful tool in order to raise the confidence among all of the victims because when you have a woman which is economically empowered, they will be more powerful on raising their voice uh, to speak openly what has happened to them and stepping up uh, for the justice. And I can say you as a very last one that we can never be able to find the peace if the survivors of the sexual violence, not only within our societies, but globally, if they will not be able to find the peace. Because without their peace and without their liberties in their hearts and their minds, we will not be able to enjoy our liberties. Thank you so much. Okay, I promised you an emotional um, afternoon, but also an inspirational one. We'll move on to another lady who is inspirational, who's going to say a few words about FGM. Yes. Okay, Dr. Would Redner. you mind if I stand up? No, no, Good. you do whatever thank you. comfortable. Yes. I'm so cold. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much, um, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you about an issue that is very, very important to me. Um, I'm from Somaliland, a country in the Horn of Africa that, like Kosovo, does not have a representation in the United Nations because we do not exist. We do exist, however. We were part of the British Empire once. British Somaliland Protectorate was part of the great British Empire. <laughs> and Britain to me is still great. But because of political reasons, we're on the other side of the moon. But I'm not here to talk about that. I love talking about my country. But what I would like to talk about today is an issue that affects me, women, girls around the world. When I was born and grew up, I had girls in the neighborhood to play with. Occasionally they would disappear and come back with little frocks and little gifts because there had been something good that had been done to them that earned them the gifts of the dresses and the things that were wearing. And the term that was used for this was they were cleansed. I didn't know what they were being cleansed from. I did not see them dirty, but that's what had happened to them. And then the day came when my loving mother and my loving grandmother decided that this was also when I too was to become cleansed. And a sheep was bought and was in the backyard 
but we often had sheep that would be slaughtered for guests, but this one was for me. And there were ladies coming into our house early in the morning, and there were conspiratorial expressions, and I was the subject of the attention. And at one fine moment, a woman I had never seen before, an old woman, not very clean, who maybe should have been cleansed, <laughs> was the master of ceremony. I was grabbed, I was put on a stool, my legs were parted, and I was cut. A cut that resulted in my losing consciousness. The pain was atrocious. To this day, I'm 79, I still remember it, 70 years ago. Thorns were used. I had no anesthesia. Yet, I was the daughter of a, of a doctor who had anesthesia. But the operation was done to me when my father was out of the country that day. And when he came back the following day and found me on a mat, not in my bed, having bled, weak, the horror on his face and the tears I saw in his eyes and the words that he had, the voice that he had raised against his, his mother and my mother, his wife, were enough to tell me that what had been done to me was wrong. My father did not approve of it. And his words were, how could you have done this to my daughter? I knew it was wrong. Something had been done to me that should not have been done. But then I was a well brought up little girl. My wounds healed. My behavior surfaced. And I kept my mouth shut and I grew up, came to your country, studied nursing, became a midwife. I never delivered a woman in your country who had been subjected to female circumcision, that's what we called it then. And then in 1961, I went home, very proud of becoming the first qualified nurse midwife the Florence Nightingale of Somaliland. I was going to change the world. I was going to change the suffering of our women. I was going to work alongside my father. And the first time I was called to deliver a woman, I saw an anatomy that I had never seen before. How was I to get a baby out of this very scarred, and mutilated part of this woman's body. My diploma, my training, my experience was of no use to me. I was not trained for that kind of a woman. I was trained for Hammersmith Hospital, for Lewisham Hospital, and the great hospitals that I had worked in and trained in. But I was at a loss. And immediately my pain, the pain that I had suffered when I was seven years old, came back to me. And it was the traditional midwives who had been there before me who showed me how to cut that woman to let the baby out. And every morning I was going to work and I was cutting, I was damaging, I was making bleed a part of, my, of a body of a woman that her pain also was reflected in me. But I was a well brought up girl and I kept my mouth shut. Until I went to Sudan as the first and only woman director in a ministry, in the Ministry of Health, I attended a Congress on obstetrics and gynecology. And of course, that was the part of the body that was to be discussed. And a discussion around female circumcision, when the audience contained men and women, religious leaders, 
traditional persons, politicians, and images were put on a screen of the anatomy of the external genitalia of a woman was a shock to me. Oh my God, how can you discuss that in the presence of men and women? Oh my God, this is not acceptable. But then I saw that this was being discussed as a medical issue. The bleeding was discussed, the infections were discussed, the fistula were discussed, the obstructed labor were discussed, the death of a baby were discussed. These were subjects that needed to be discussed by wise people, by health professionals, and a solution had to be found for it. And I soaked it up and I thought, my goodness, yes, you can talk about it. I didn't know how I was going to use that bullet. It was an ammunition that I acquired in that conference hall in 1968. And I went home, went back to Mogadishu. One fine day, the minister comes to me and says, uh, Mrs. Edna, there's a conference on women, um, women's democratic alliance or something was being set up. And you, as the only female director in the ministry, we give you the privilege to go and talk to your sisters. You like talking to your sisters, you're always talking. So I said, sure. I had no preparation. I hadn't thought about it. That bullet was still there. I didn't know how I was going to use it. And somehow the words came out of me. And I said, Mr. Minister, what would you like me to discuss? He said, oh, whatever, you know, the usual things, you know, prenatal care, vaccinations, whooping cough, Ezos, breastfeeding, whatever, anything. And I said, well, Mr. Minister, if that decision is left to me, then I will talk about female circumcision. That was the first time the word had come out of my mouth. And I was saying this to a Somali man. A Somali woman is talking about genitals and circumcision and reproductive organs. And he said, and no, you can't talk about that. You're forgetting who you are. You're the former first lady. You're, you're, you're the daughter of Dr. Adam. You can't talk about that. And I said, Mr. Minister, if I don't talk about that, then who else will? I will talk about that. That's the subject I will. I said, no, you can't. No, no, talk about me. So let's talk about I said, no, no, I'll talk about that. He gave in. And I said, and by the way, Mr. Minister, you will be there when I make that speech because I will be speaking on behalf of the ministry. He said, but I'm a man, I can't be there when you talk about that. He said, Mr. Minister, you will be there because you are a minister of health even for that part of the body. And if you're not there when I speak about it, I will talk about measles. No, but I gave you permission to talk about female circumcision. I said, yes, but you will be there. So we played ping pong. He agreed. That was the first time I spoke about it. That was the first time that I shared the information that I had acquired in the Sudan, that female circumcision is contrary to the teachings of Islam. It's contrary to the teachings of Christianity and Judaism. It's contrary to every human right that human beings have. It's a mutilation that has no place on this planet in this day and age. <laughs> Easily said, but what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. We came here, nobody would give us a platform to speak about it. No, no, this is an African problem. No, we don't want to talk about that. We would picket the United Nations. We would picket the Organization of African Unity. We would there would be very few places who would give us a platform to speak about it. And for the sake of strategy, I know the value of the social aspects, the human rights aspects, the sexuality aspects associated with female circumcision or female gender mutilation. But I keep that aside. I don't want it to clutter my discussions and my arguments. And I focus on the subjects that people understand, that women in that village 
when I sit, sit on the mat on the ground with her to talk about FGM. I don't say on Monday I'll be coming to talk to you about FGM. I say, I would like to visit you on Monday and I would like to learn from you and I would like to hear what, how the hell situation is in the village. And we talk about the goats and we talk about the weather and we talk about the children and we talk about the cough and we talk about the... And then we come to the point of female circumcision. Because you need to put get the audience to put their guns down first and be receptive. But a new bullet that I have discovered, and I would like, in fact, two bullets, if I have time, okay. Madam Chair. <laughs> One bullet is that I had always ignored the fathers. The girl has a mother and a father. And if you do not involve the father, and if you allow the fathers to hide behind the skirts of, oh, but this is a woman's issue, we will not get anywhere. And by the way, it's 97% of the women who come to my prenatal clinic have had some form of female genital mutilation. It's not 75 or 80, I wish it were, it's 97%. Fathers have to be involved, religious leaders have to be involved, politicians have to be involved. And when I was foreign minister, that was one thing I took advantage of as well, being a woman. And I would go to countries like yours and I would say, please grant me one little favor. Add your voice to the effects of female genital mutilation among your, the communities from our part of the world who are living with you. And the example that I would use is if when I apply to a visa, for a visa to, to go to your countries, I have to fill a form. And I have to answer yes or no. Have I been committed of a crime? I have to say yes or no. If I say yes, if I say, well, yesterday I just killed somebody, they're not gonna give me a visa. Have I ever robbed a bank? Have I ever been a terrorist? Oh, well, yesterday I just robbed a bank. They're not gonna give me a visa. But it's a moral check. And I would say no. And on the basis of my word, by saying no, they trust me. And they give me that visa. But if they give me a visa on the basis of a wrong information that I have given, then I have broken that law and they have a right to deport me. So I would say, please, can we, we don't need to cut down another tree and make paper. Please just add a line below all those, have you done this, yes, no, have you ever had mental illness, yes or no. Do you understand that if you are granted permission to enter that country, that female genital mutilation is a crime that may affect your status of residing in our country, yes or no, I have to say yes. And if I break that law, then that whole family must be responsible for it. And the precious sons will also be deported. And the other children will be deported, not only the mother, but the father also. And if countries along the world where refugees seek asylum, also make sure that as refugees come in, this is a law that they will have to respect. I think many girls would be saved. That's one ammunition. The other ammunition is like any war. Maybe we'll have a picture. I need soldiers. There's too many soldiers with guns and killing people. I need soldiers who can communicate, who can reason, who can explain, who can plead with the communities who need to be convinced. And when my country returned from war, from 11 years of civil war, and our hospitals were leveled to the ground and schools were leveled to the ground and homes and churches and mosques and chapels and whatever were leveled to the ground, hospitals, that is one of the hospitals in our country. 
That was a shock, it was a reality shock to me. When that was happening in my country, I was a very senior diplomat, working for the World Health Organization, earning thousands of dollars, worrying about my uh, designer clothes and what kind of a car was I going to have. And, and that's how my people were. And I thought, it's either that goat or me. And something came to the surface in my heart and in my mind. A disease that I have always suffered from. A disease that I hope I will never be cured from. I suffer from a disease that's, called, that's called, I've got to fix that. <laughs> and I said, I've got to fix that. I'm a nurse, I'm a midwife, money has been spent on me. I've been born with that proverbial silver spoon in my mouth. My father was a doctor, I was a former first lady, I've been a minister, I've been this and that. And that's how my people live. I've got to fix that. And what I did is I retired, came home, recycled my whole life, turned everything I had into cold cash, went home, and built a hospital. Why not? People retire and buy a yacht. This is my yacht. And I live there. This is the hospital. That's my room, that's my bedroom. Yes, I have a bigger window than everybody else, but I spend half a million. So you want a bigger window? Give me half a million. That's my office. There's a training. And we have an outpatient here that was built, by the way, by the United States. Britain gave me the first beds. Your taxpayers' money is in my wards, baby cots, operating theater equipment. And the site upon which this hospital was built is very important. It was a killing ground. It was an execution ground. It was a trash dump. It was in a part of the city where they had never had a hospital before. Because that was the only land that nobody wanted and they've given to me. And when all my money had gone, had left, and I sold everything, by the way, if you ever come to me and you use my bathrooms and you pull a chain or, or whatever, you'll be using my sapphire. You might be using my diamond. <laughs> you might be using my emerald. Because when I built a hospital, I had no faucets. I had no toilets. Now what's a hospital without toilets? So I just sold the last bits of things I had. I'm just as happy as I am with this. 50 rupees in New Delhi. <laughs> Why not? I love Absolutely. it. Thank you. Everything went in there. And now, my army. That's my army. <laughs> They're trained to look after the sick. They're trained to deliver babies. They're trained to counsel against FGM. And if one of them says, no, I can't talk about that. I'm, I, no, I, no, I came to train as a nurse. I, I, I don't want to talk about that. I say, well, I'm sorry. That's my pound of flesh. You don't want to talk about FGM? Go and waste somebody else's time. And they must talk about it. And by the time they've been trained and by the time they've counseled women again and again, they feel comfortable speaking about it. And I will tell you the... Some of these girls have gone on to do further studies. And today, I have two women doctors. This is one of them, Dr. Na Dr. Naima. And can we go back, please? This is a very historical picture. This mother and this young lady went to primary school together. This one dropped out, it was during the war, during the refugee in Ethiopia. This one dropped out. This one continued. Trained with me as a nurse, trained as a midwife, and I gave her and another one a scholarship to go and train in medicine. Today, she's the obstetrician. 
She's the gynecologist. She has just performed the cesarean section to deliver the baby of her schoolmate. That's what a woman who's gone to school in a refugee camp can become. And this is the icing on the cake. Dr. Na Dr. Shukri and I were in Washington just last month. And Dr. Shukri is someone who operates not only with a scalpel, she operates with her heart. She's a woman who has become so dedicated and passionate about children who are born with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. She has operated on over 350 children brought to our hospital, free of charge, by the way, from Somalia, Somaliland, Djibouti, and parts of Ethiopia. That girl who went to school in a refugee camp, who was first a nurse and a midwife, is today a doctor who is the person who operates little girls, little children with spina bifida, club feet, and who rose to lecture at the American College of Surgeons. Now that, to me, is as high as a woman in Somaliland can climb. And it shows that there is no ceiling, glass or otherwise. The ceiling is where you put it yourself, is as low and as high as you can make it. The sky's the limit. That's a good point to finish on, Edna. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to my two speakers. They are truly inspirational. They are both working in very difficult situations um, on topics which are basically silences of history. But thanks to these two women, we are here talking about it. We're talking about these women who suffer from rape and other sexual abuse as a result of, uh, particularly as a result of, of conflict, but of course other women get raped, etc. And we've talked about FGM, something that I think Edna has really brought to, to life for us. It's something you don't talk about in these communities. Both of these women have been very um, privileged, if you don't mind me saying, in that they have both managed to rise to political office in their own countries. And I'm so proud that they were able, in their political offices and after, to promote these issues internationally and in their own countries. And, if you like, are shining a light on an issue that really needs to come out from the darkness. You too can, can contribute. I'm going to give you three dates that you might just want to, to note. The 25th of November, for example, is International White Ribbon Day. That's a day which focuses on ending violence towards women and girls. Please go out there, tweet whatever you do on that date. I think it's next week sometime. Second date I'd like you to put in your diary is the 6th of February. That is UN FGM Zero Tolerance Day, another day when we highlight um, FGM, of course. And then an, 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 a date, which is a whole 12 month date. 2017 is the EU's year of action against gender based violence. And there will be lots happening in 2017 that I hope you will get involved in. We want a ripple effect. I wouldn't, in fact, I think we both, or three of us, would want more than a ripple. We want a wave, we want a tsunami. We want these human rights abuses to end. And we don't want to be sitting here in 10 years' time saying the same things. Thank you very much. Please show your appreciation I to say, our speakers. Can I just say one little word? Uh, if we it's can, a very quick very word, Edna. Yeah, I just, I'm sure there are students out there who want to study about FGM. Please go on our website and you'll find a lot of data on the research that we've done first one and a comparative one and uh, I just want to know that Thank on you. the 12th we have we will be launching the Edna, Fund, Edna Hospital Foundation charity in the UK fantastic so these are also where we'll be Thank able you. to follow Thank Would you, you like to say something I'd like yes.
Just give the last word to the president here, who's been very quiet for the last 30 minutes. Please. Yeah. Uh, Hazel, thank you so much, and Eden, thank you so much. And uh, you mentioned a few minutes earlier that uh, we had a great discussion and we talked about uh, this uh, phenomena which has happened for several decades in the past, and I'm afraid it's happening now, yes. and I'm afraid it's going to happen in the near future. I think now is the time that we really need to act, that we need to move from talking in taking the actions. And I hope that 2017, it will be the year of the actions because uh, the survivors of the sexual violence, trust me, from my own experience, I can speak uh, that they don't ask much. Mm -hmm. They just ask for the hand to reach to, the ear that they can talk to, and the voice that they can speak through. Because by doing this, we are not only going to bring a peace in the hearts and the minds of the victims, but trust me, History is not going to forgive us. And let's bring that peace also in our hearts. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.